So understanding the narratives is very difficult. Yes. And I, I think the, the best way to do this as an investor is to be an active participant, mm. to really be very active in the market. We use DeFi, we collect NFTs, we bridge to new chains. Uh, you know, we're in the arena, we're trying things, you know, so uh, that helps us to track the narratives well mm -hmm. and you have to look and support the, the founders we invest in. We have to support them with, you know, understanding how the market works. Hello, welcome to the future of the future money. Today, we will be with Charles Reed CEO of Leostone Capital. Charles Reed CEO is selected by Forbes as a 30-year-old, 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 Uh, please have an introduction of yourself and the rare stone capital to the camera. Sure. sure. Hi everyone, I'm Charles Reed. I'm the founder of Rare Stone Ventures, which is a Web3 venture fund and venture incubator, uh, which is Rare Stone Labs. We've invested in over 100 teams in Web3 since 2020, and we're really excited to be here in Korea and talk a bit more about our story and one of our core incubation projects, Zap. According to Forbes, Uh, you have started the company with only just uh, $10,000. Yeah. Uh, and how come you make the company so big right now? That's a great question. We started as, I've been in crypto since 2016. Oh, to, so early. 2016, yeah. it was very, very late uh, before the 2017 bull uh, market. Yeah. Uh, and I was very interested in learning about decentralization and Web3 technology, even before it was called Web3 then really. Um, we, how I got into crypto was I was a writer. I did a lot of research, I was an analyst, and uh, it didn't pay very well. So I started with a very small amount of money. Um, we, you know, I've worked in the industry as an analyst, as a, as a writer. I've worked with a number of projects as well uh, early on in my journey. And then I started Rare Stone in 2020. Uh, it was more of an advisory firm at the time. We were helping projects with their strategy, their marketing, uh, content, and token economics and incentive design. Um, we were very successful because we took all of our payments in tokens. So we worked with some projects very early on, yeah. uh, and them tokens performed well. So we went from having a very small amount of startup capital yeah. to suddenly, you know, a, a lot more. And we moved away from the consulting more to the venture side to actually investing in more companies at that point. Okay. Like, just, just like as you said, the, in Web3 uh, yeah. ecosystem, you have invested in more than 100 uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, what's the main reason you choose the blockchain industry to uh, invest by yourself? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I love the concept of decentralization. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the crypto market has presented an opportunity for uh, everyone to actually have access to a new form of wealth creation yeah. as well. Uh, it's very hard to make it trading stocks. Uh, crypto is a little bit wild west, yeah. but there's a lot of opportunity here. And wherever there's innovation, there's a really good opportunity to make money. Um, and, you know, I've been obsessed with, with crypto, decentralization and, and Web3 since the very beginning. And that's allowed me to have staying power throughout the, the bear markets. Yeah. You know, it's a very volatile industry, but because of that obsession, I kept my head in the game, even when things were hard. And that's what allowed us to, you know, really build quite quickly. And, and you know, I'm as excited now in 2024 as I was in 2016, 2017. It's great. Yeah. Can you tell me some of the projects uh, you invest in? It yeah, absolutely. becomes a famous. Yeah. Which one is the famous? The, my, my biggest investment personally was Solana. Solana. I did uh, the very early Solana investment. When was it? Uh, 2018. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, and that was locked for two years. And when it listed, I think it was $2. And uh, I was very bullish on the Solana team. Yeah. So I held 
most of my Solana position. We also invested in Manta, Manta Network, Manta. back in 2021, mm. which recently became a uh, very successful listing. Uh, Gito is another one, Gito, infrastructure yeah. on Solana. These are some of our bigger investments. Oh, it's good. Cool. The big names. The bigger names, the, the ones names. that people know. Yeah. Very successful, yeah. I think. Okay, and next question. Can you tell me the, what is the representative portfolios are and what the reason for seeing the potential in this market? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I talk often about backing great founders. Um, sometimes we, we hear a pitch or an idea and we're not sold on the product. Mm -hmm. But if the founder is really compelling and, and we believe that they are able to be nimble and potentially pivot, because crypto is a very innovative industry. It's always changing, always evolving. So yeah. you need a founder who can adapt to that circumstance. Um, so first and foremost is backing amazing founders who are able to be nimble. Yeah. That's really what we look for. Um, of course, you know, there are narratives. It's important to understand the narrative before it evolves. Yeah. For example, with Solana, it was an early investment for us. We knew that when Solana was launched, there would need to be DeFi primitives and core infrastructure pieces. So we looked for them particular projects before they existed because we knew the users would go to Solana, they would need the products. So we're always trying to understand where the next narrative is and that helps us to identify certain ecosystems to operate in as well. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that, that's been a, a real key for us. Okay. Then the next question may be so related to your interest in this market. Mm -hmm. So what are the, some of the most exciting uh, projects or innovations in this market that you have recently seen or invested in mm -hmm. uh, within the Rep3 ecosystem? Yeah, I think there's been, it's been an interesting six months because the bear market was very horrible for everyone. Horrible. Uh, yeah. Winter. It, win, the crypto winter, it was very cold for a long time. Uh, and, you know, the last six months, everything's gone crazy again. Yeah. We've seen some really interesting narratives emerge with AI. Um, I believe you spoke with our friends at Delicium yeah. today. Uh, you know, AI is a very interesting narrative right now, very exciting. Um, we're also interested in new layer twos. So new the Blast two. ecosystem is very interesting to us. We're actually incubating a project on Blast called Zap. And that's due to the native yield that the stable coin on the chain accrues. So that creates lots of interesting incentive models for users. And people love airdrops. They love free money. So lots of users are gravitating towards that chain. Um, there's lots of other new projects in our portfolio uh, that you know we're excited about and uh, for anyone watching you can check our blog yeah. and, and learn a bit more about some of them other investments yeah uh, this might be the personal question then do you think the nfts and DeFi spring DeFi prosperity mm. uh, can be returned in that's the a future? great question yeah that's a great question i'm a big i collected a lot of nfts most of them, it was art. I was collecting art. Yeah. I probably spent too much money on <laughs> NFTs during the, the bull market, but um, I do think that a lot of the NFT bull market was driven by you know, FOMOs of profile pictures. Sure. And I don't think that there's as much interest at this point yeah. in, uh, in collectible JPEG pictures. Yeah. We've seen a lot of interest on Bitcoin Bitcoin NFTs yeah. as right now the dominant narrative. We're not seeing much interest in Ethereum NFTs. I am excited to watch NFTs take a return, but I'm, you know, I'm a little bit apprehensive about Ethereum NFTs for now. Um, and your other question uh, was DeFi. Yeah, DeFi. Uh, I, I think DeFi again uh, has kind of found a new home. People are looking right. at DeFi. Already. Yeah, they're looking at DeFi on new layer twos, and you know, and this is also where the incentives and, and the, the network flywheel comes in for Blast. Is when there's incentives, there's users and attention. So the innovative tools are being built on new blockchains, and there's there's less innovation on Ethereum. Naturally, though, as crypto prices increase, we will continue to see uh, new DeFi products, but 
where there is return, there is usually risk as well. Yeah, meaning that how does Rareston Capital approach investment strategies in this very evolving, very uh, frustrating, mm -hmm. you know, fluctuate, fluctuating uh, market in, in this market? Mm -hmm. So how do you react to do that? That's a good question. It's very difficult to stay with your finger on the pulse of the market all the time mm -hmm. and to f follow the narratives on Solana, the narratives on Ethereum, uh, you know, the different regions of interest. I know, you know, what's popular in Korea is not necessarily popular in America or, you know, in, in Europe. So understanding the narratives is very difficult. Yes. And I, I think the, the best way to do this as an investor is to be an active participant, mm. to really be very active in the market. Uh, at Rarestone, we're all super users. We call ourselves super users. We use DeFi, we collect NFTs, we bridge to new chains. Uh, you know, we're in the arena, we're trying things, you know? So uh, that helps us to track the narratives well. Mm -hmm. And I notice if I take one week as holiday, I lose some narratives or I miss some narratives. Yes. So, you know, I'll never be able to catch all of them, but by being very active, working with our portfolio, reading lots, understanding how, you know, influential figures in the industry, what they're looking at, what they're pointing people towards, that helps us to, you know, keep a track of what the narratives are. Just like retail investors? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Living absolutely. on in telegrams? <laughs> the, exactly, <laughs> and day. understanding who they're looking towards yeah. for information and, and, you know, what narratives they're interested in. Because it's the attention economy and you have to look and support the, the founders we invest in. We have to support them with, you know, understanding how the market works. Okay, good. In this tough circumstance around the crypto market, uh, the way or uh, method of searching and choosing a unique one for invest, how do you find it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, traveling, speaking to people, yeah. you know, trying new things. Um, we have some very good deal flow partners and we share opportunities with them. But also, it's not about always finding a good investment, it's about working with the team to make your investment successful. Wow. We really believe that we have to support the founders we work with, not just with financial capital, but also intellectual capital. We want to support them with marketing, strategy, token economics and incentive design. And that will also help our investments to be successful. We don't just want to give money and then hope everything will be good because there's a lot of plates to spin when you're a founder. There's a lot of things to understand. So I think it's important that we work alongside the founders that we back. Okay, since we have conversation this time, I thought I'm talking to a very Web3 company, yeah. not a finance institution. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference between the finance institution and yours? Yeah, we, we're definitely not a traditional company. <laughs> yeah, um, we're very much, you know, crypto operators, a little yeah. bit degen. You know, we, you know, as I said, we're doing the, the yield farming, the NFT collecting, and uh, we, we roll up our sleeves. We, we help people that we invest with. Yeah. So we're not, uh, we d when we invest, we're very quick. We can make a decision in one day. We can invest within two or three days. Mm -hmm. So we're not like a big financial institution or a big fund that takes six to eight weeks, multiple calls. Sometimes I'm happy to shake someone's hand and say, hey, you know what, we'll invest, we'll cut a check for you guys because I think this founder is going to do good things. So we're definitely not, uh, you know, the traditional style of, of fun, <laughs> but, but I can wear a suit sometimes <laughs> if I need to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very much, you know, we're crypto. We're crypto uh, all the way. It sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's cool, really cool. So I have to ask you, the, what are the, your thoughts on the current state of crypto, uh, cryptocurrency market? Mm -hmm. And any of prediction for the near future? Yeah, I think things are very good now. Mm -hmm. uh, much better than they were 12 months ago. I think a lot of people are scared to jump back in. Uh, because how aggressive things were in the winter. But I see no signs of, uh, you know, slowing down just yet. 
I think we continue to... Slowing down or fluctuation? Well, fluctuation is inevitable, right? Yeah. Especially with Bitcoin is up from, you know, around $20,000 to 70. And actually in Korea, there is a premium on Bitcoin. Kimchi. Yeah, the, the kimchi <laughs> premium. It's even more expensive here than anywhere else. So that shows incredible demand for crypto assets yeah, sure. in the region. Um, but, you know, volatility is, is always going to be a thing. I think it's um, some predictions. I think, you know, the meme coin cycle is going to continue to build traction. Uh, meme coins are a very expressive way to gamble, mm -hmm. especially in America. We're seeing these, you know, meme coins about Donald Trump and Joe Biden about the elections. And it's a way for people to gamble on certain things. Um, and also, I believe that we'll continue to see innovate, innovation on other blockchains yeah. as well as Ethereum, as well as Bitcoin. And uh, we'll get some really interesting products the next few months. Do you think is there any possibility of collapse, collapsing of market in the future just because uh, regulation environment or uh, meme coin uh, regulations also? There's always risk, right? As you said earlier, there's always risk. Um, I think it will be harder for Bitcoin to collapse as much as it did before yeah. because of the ETFs. Um, this is just more of a steady inflow of capital. Sure. capital. It also gives traditional finance a little bit more of uh, security and confidence in the crypto market. Uh, but of course, these higher risk assets, these meme coins, what people typically rush to gamble into, lower uh, market cap. What about the common art coin? The common, common old coin? Yeah, I think this is going to be very volatile because one moment, AI is very popular. Yes. Then all the AI coins go up. Then the next minute, something else is popular and you have these fluctuations. Also now, it's much easier to launch coins. So there's, instead last, you know, last cycle, maybe there's five or 10,000. Now there is 50 or 60,000. And each cycle, there's more coins. There's more attention, but that attention is where the, the money will go. So uh, I'm personally, you know, wouldn't encourage people to go and buy loads of meme coins, yeah. um, but to, to, to buy, you know, crypto assets and infrastructure assets for these new emerging chains. But in other words, like uh, inflow of the money into the cryptocurrency market, is it, is it just good or we have to think about that? Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? Yeah, the ETF helps with the inflow, right? But it, that money goes into Bitcoin, it doesn't go into altcoins. Yes. So, you know, that doesn't mean that just because money is coming into Bitcoin that your altcoins are going to go up. Mm -hmm. What it actually means is Bitcoin will continue to grow in strength, but the altcoins have more attention to compete for because there's so many other altcoins now. So everyone's always competing for, for everyone's attention. So the inflows are good for Bitcoin and eventually I believe Ethereum will have an ETF. And then once we have Ethereum ETF, then perhaps we have top 10 altcoin ETF. That's good Just for Just like altcoins. Solana ETF. Yeah, absolutely. Or a basket of crypto assets in the top 10 or the top 20. Uh, that would be good for altcoins. But for now, I think we've actually also seen the Bitcoin ETF inflows have slowed down a little bit. So the, the flow of capital has, has dropped. So the reason why I ask you about the policy and the regulations mm -hmm. is related to the next question regarding regulation and policy. Uh, what are the other challenges or risks mm -hmm. uh, that crypto space faces? How do you overcome from them? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think each region is different, of course. Uh, I know that uh, here US, in Korea, Asian Pacific. yeah, and, and here in Korea, the, the regulatory landscape has evolved the yes. last few years and a lot of people got in a lot of trouble. And I think that's good. It means the industry is maturing. Yes. Uh, and this is important, right? But, uh, you know, w when things evolve, potentially the opportunities can slow down. The risk reward balances a little bit. Um, but I think it's net positive to have these emerging and consistent discussions around the, the regulations. Mm. Uh, but it is very regional. Some projects 
they'll just leave one region, go somewhere else and launch scams there instead. And they're still accessible. If you have a blockchain address, you can still access them. So I think it's really important that the education piece around individual investment responsibility. Yes. You can't expect the government to protect you from making bad choices all the time. Of course, they have to do something, but it's important that we as people in crypto are educating those to, to really do research and understand where they're putting their ca capital. Yeah, crypto always been risky, right? Always has been, and it probably yeah. always will be as well. That's part <laughs> will of the, be. <laughs> yeah, the, the part of the benefit of being able to access a blockchain from anywhere in the world, it's permissionless. That means it creates risk, but also reward as well. Okay. I have to ask you about the fundraising. Yep. Fundraising is very, you know, how to say, very tricky, yep. picky. Oh. Yeah, there, there's a... Uh, can, you say, can you tell us about the landscape of mm -hmm. investment, especially in crypto market? Yeah, absolutely. Raising money in crypto has always evolved. We yeah. had the ICO craze in 2017. Yeah. And... Uh, then we had the DeFi, which we had something called like a bonding curve, where if you buy early, you get a better price. And then we had the IDO platform where you invest in a token and launch it on a launch pad. And now we're seeing some of these emerge and combine and very popular in Asia yeah. is uh, the concept of like a node sale where uh, you, you buy a node and then you unlock rewards. Node sale. Node sale, yeah. And one company called Aether, they just raised 120 million really? in one day from a node sale. And mo a lot of the buy pressure come from Korea. So this is a really interesting model that's very popular at the moment. Um, and we're seeing this, a lot of people are saying it's the return of the ICO, the initial coin offering. And there's more interest now in public facing raises rather than insiders and insider information because historically the crypto market has been very favored for early investors even like myself you do the seed round yeah. and you get much bigger discount than the public we're seeing a change now where the public are getting access to good deals early and i think that's a great thing as well is there uh, how they are impacting the fundraising mm -hmm. the landscape by by the evolving mm -hmm. environment yeah so that is making it easier to raise money actually making it easier it's making it easier but only if certain things are set in place so um, it has to be attractive for people to promote uh, particularly in the in the region in, in asia in korea people like to promote these types of sales if they can get benefits uh, yeah. and that allows this big chain reaction of investors to, to come in so that's a big impact i think that it does present some risk especially if you know companies are raising hundreds of millions of dollars because it's much harder to give everyone a return on their investment uh, so that will definitely be an interesting trend to watch in the next few months because we'll see bigger and bigger fundraisers and that usually is a sign that the market is going into the later stages of the bull market. Uh, we saw in 2018 or 2017, Telegram raised like $8 billion. Yeah, with a ton. Uh, yeah, with a ton. <laughs> and then there was a big scandal around it and they had to refund lots of investors. And uh, we'll see more things like that toward the end of the cycle where people are raising hundreds of millions. And I think that's when we start to say, okay, now I've got to be a little bit more careful and slow down and, and not be too greedy because that's a sign potentially of the late stage of the market. Okay, it was actually the, the, the answer from you is, is from the uh, fundraiser's view actually. Yeah. And now I have to ask you about the you know, retail investor's view. Can you spe specify how this will impact to the retail investors? I think retail, the, the risk will go up yeah. for them as time goes on. Yeah. Uh, and this is why I also mentioned that education is very important to understand, you know, what you're buying, how, where, when, you know, where you buy, how much you're spending. 
but this creates opportunity for them too because it's democratizing access to investments and as we move more from the insider uh, early stage funding model to more of a public model then there's more opportunity for retail investors but of course everyone should be very careful about what they're what they're investing in and uh, you know really ensure that that they've done their their research and that where their money goes they can see that they're going to get a return i see this this symptom is 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 creating some of the the result of uh you know increasing risks yeah isn't it yeah absolutely how we have to react to that yeah i think unfortunately it will be the regulators who react to that uh, it will be um because you know as more retail get uh, you know into bad investments and lose more money then we have this reactive effect from the regulators mm. and that's a uh, net positive it's good for the industry but we you know have to educate ourselves to uh, to do our best to not give the wrong people yeah. our money DYOR yeah and also you, we saw what happened with with Terra and with Duquan and yeah uh, you know the I think one of the biggest problems there was this promise of 20% return on your money uh, you know and people were putting millions in and I promises. think that promises is, is where the risk is and trusting you know you have to be you have to trust people of course but you have to be very careful okay anyway uh, even if it's a very risky market actually mm -hmm. but uh, everyone in this market expects a bull market this year yeah definitely yeah the, can you share our, your opinion about the market forecast and and the reason behind it I think we are going to see potentially a, a, a bit of a market top this year at some point and another high next year um, especially in Bitcoin I can see Bitcoin trading above two hundred thousand dollars above two hundred thousand dollars and this or uh, maximum uh, <laughs> at least <laughs> I'll say least, at okay. least uh, I think Solana will trade high up to a thousand yeah. but uh, I recommend people to just buy slowly over a longer period of time yeah. so they have a better entry price rather than buy everything now. I'm definitely not giving any financial just advice. Just like dollar cost averaging. Exactly. Yeah, dollar cost average into these crypto assets slowly. And then if the market goes up or down, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You're still buying some very regularly. I think one of the biggest problems people have is they FOMO. They see the prices up and yeah. then they buy. Then the price goes down, they get scared, they're nervous. Fear and greedy. Fear, fear and greed, yeah, exactly. So um, I forecast you know, things to go much higher than, than they this are year. now. I think AI is going to do great as well. Um, I think we continue to see more emerging AI projects and crazy valuations there. And I think also we're going to see more public sale and more retail accessible investments, which I think is great. Uh, thank you for your clear opinion that then I heard that you have very much of interest in career market actually this is the reason why you are here yeah absolutely I've not been to Korea for six years my last trip was 2018 oh. Korea blockchain week so it's great to be back here and I made some good friends this week the reason for the interest in the region one of our incubation projects zap which is a, la a launch pad on blast we noticed that uh, a big portion of our community were in Korea and we didn't do any Korean marketing. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this Ooh. is, yeah, this is interesting. So it's important for us to each region that we see demand that we support multiple languages and that we build community there and we're having good open discourse about our product because our product is targeting retail investors. So we want to get feedback from retail investors. We want to make sure we're supporting each region. So uh, Korea is our largest community yeah. for Zap, but there are also you know, other communities which are big. The Russian speaking audience is big for us too. And we do plan to continue to build new communities all over the world, but I'm glad to, uh, to be back here. And So many people are very uh, enthusiastic on the crypto market, mm -hmm. but uh, Korean investors on Korean uh, blockchain companies are very struggling 
to mm. invest uh, properly yeah. in the crypto market just because of very strict atmosphere mm -hmm. and the regulations by government. Mm -hmm. uh, how the Korean investors and industry personnel can be survived yeah. in this situation? That's a really good question. I think a lot of the demand will go overseas. So Korean institutions will invest in companies overseas uh, to get access to, to crypto Just assets, like hash it. which is it's um, you know it's a shame because obviously it's good to have local crypto businesses but uh, you know a lot of the crypto VC funds that we know who are based here they now have more international presence so they're going to Singapore the UAE uh, and the US as well so um, the great thing about crypto is because it's very accessible you can still invest in, uh, you know, which is good and bad, as we discussed. Yeah. But it's still accessible for investors, even if there are, you know, regulations here. A lot of companies will go and choose to build elsewhere. But I think that particularly after what happened in 2020, we did need some aggressive regulation yeah. because the Korean market has to be protected from these big, you know, big scams and scandals. And that is evident with how much volume comes from the Korean market. The exchanges here are very professional. They're very careful about who they work with. Yeah. And I think we need to see that more in other regions, actually. So I think Korea is setting a good example for other regions. Okay. Actually, in Korean market and Korean policy, the uh, protection Act for the cryptocurrency users is at, is gone active on July mm. uh, this year. So many things going to be changed in environment, mm -hmm. and it's gonna be very harsh. Is it? Yeah. Interesting. So uh, I just want to hear about your opinion. Any tips mm -hmm. of investing in cryptocurrency in the tough market? Yeah, I think it's difficult for me to comment on without understanding yeah. them rules. Yeah. Um, what I would say though is there are institutions here who will make it their job to uh, provide access to good opportunities. So the bigger exchanges here, like Upbit, yeah. I, I believe BitThumb Bit as yeah. well, and a few others, they will make sure to follow them rules and then offer investments which comply with them rules. So I do hope that the Korean market still has access to amazing investments. And I think that it's good that them rules are being put into place. Okay, this is all we have today. Yeah. yeah thank you for your opinion and thank you for your answer. Thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you for having us today. Awesome. Thank you. 네, 지금까지 미래의 돈을 만나보는 퓨처머니 오늘 레어스톤 캐피탈의 찰스 리드 CEO와 함께 했습니다. 다음 시간에도 더 많은 이야기로 돌아오겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 안녕. Bye.